Thank you for joining us. Our show today is with Dr. Ren Newman, Chair of the Nova Southeastern University Speech-Language Pathology Department. SLPs work to diagnose, treat speech-language and social cognitive communication and swallowing disorders in children and adults. This includes speech and language disorders and cognitive communication disorders including problems organizing one's thoughts, which is something we may all need help with. Dr. Newman will join us following these messages. Life Extension Magazine brings you new discoveries in health and anti-aging. Our science-based research and supplements are so advanced, they're many years ahead of the medical mainstream with quality control standards that exceed FDA mandates. Life Extension has covered groundbreaking medical research for more than 35 years. For your health and future, you deserve the best. Learn more at lifeextension.com. Carrier asks, what does comfort mean to you? Is it a cool breeze on a scorching day? Or a cozy corner on a cold night? <laughs> that every room of the house is as inviting as the next. And the air is fresh and clean for everyone. That humidity is where it belongs. At Carrier, comfort means more than just the temperature. And the people who invented modern air conditioning keep inventing new ways to make you comfortable. However you define it. When I was young, it seemed that life was so wonderful. A miracle. Oh, it was beautiful, magical. And then they showed me a world. Find magic again. Sprout by HP. With Intel RealSense technology inside, now you can bend the rules of creativity outside. It's no secret that the Israeli brain is the most important resource of our small country. Endless curiosity, the desire to learn and to find answers to some of the toughest questions starts at a young age. Meet the students who, even before they turned 18, were key members of a team that launched nano satellites into space. <laughs> yeah, space. Rom Bachar from the Herzliya Space Program is responsible for the satellite ground station and is developing a chip for communication between satellites in space. Satellite communication is one of the most important issues in the field. The second most important issue, explaining to your parents what it is you do. In this project, we're going to launch a constellation of satellites that will be built by high school students all around Israel. Ilan Riblov, also from the Herzliya Space Program, was the head of the Hupo 2 team, which launched a nano research satellite into space. It's about the size of a milk carton, and it was launched by NASA to the International Space Station to collect research data. Sure, it sounds hard, but it's not rocket science. Uh. The scientific mission of the Khipat 3 is to photograph Earth and make ecological research. Students from diverse communities participated in building the satellite. Students from Shara Negev, Taibe, Yerucham, Natseret, Kiat Ata, Khura, and Ulpana students from Ofra and Ofakim. Meet Orit Shachar. When she was still in school, she had already conducted substantial research on neuronal differentiation at the prestigious Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel, one of the leading research institutes in the world. I've been very interested in biology since I was a kid, and when I joined the Alpha program, they gave me this research, which is in uh, molecular biology and genetics. So like uh, 20 years from now, what do you see yourself uh, accomplishing? I would like to discover something that would give us a better understanding of our world. This young man is Idan Rhein, and he has performed impressive research work in the field of astrophysics on the quantitative characterization of planets outside the solar system. The end goal of these studies is to find an Earth-like planet around a different solar system. In addition, a more theoretical goal is to understand how solar systems are created. Let's not waste any more of his time. I'm going to go make him a sandwich.
With us now is Dr. Wen Newman. It's such a pleasure to have you on the Shalom Show Thank finally. Thank you so very much. My pleasure to be here. You are in charge of a very interesting department in Nova University in Health and Speech Pathology. I'm not sure many of our audience actually understand what that includes. Please share with us. So uh, speech pathology and really speech language pathology looks at disorders or differences that impact an individual's communication. So it can be receptive understanding or it can be what we, um, how we speak or it can be the language that we use. And um, these difficulties obviously impact both children and adults. And depending on the particular uh, problem area, uh, it can be a mild problem, like a child that says wabbit instead of rabbit, or it can be something very severe, like a stroke or a traumatic brain injury or autism. So our focus in our department, <clears throat> excuse me, is to prepare our students to work in a variety of settings, schools, hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, um, private practice, and uh, prepare them in general across all of those areas, and many specialize in a particular area of our field. How does autism affect uh, one's speech? Well, it more likely affects their language. So speech is the sound production and um, the voice tone we have. Um, and language is really how we comprehend and how we express. And so children with autism or adults with autism often have difficulty in socialization and communication in that regard. Now, uh, is your area basically focused on therapy or is it uh, also inclusive with, with regard to medication and so forth? So not so much. We might work and, and there's such a big area now in interprofessional education and interprofessional practice so that we work in collaboration rather than each discipline having a silo. Um, so when we work with, let's say, a patient that has had a stroke, um, we would be likely um, having some interaction with the uh, medical team that's addressing this so that we can share our concerns. If there are medications, that would be managed by the physician, but often that impacts, as we know, um, how um, alert a patient is, um, and so we can discuss our observations and hopefully work in a collaborative team um, to get the best outcome for patients. Interesting. I once read a book called Cybernetics, and uh, it discussed how plastic surgery can affect a person's self-esteem or image of themselves and change their behavior. Are there uh, similarities with regard to speech? Well, there can be. We work with individuals with cleft palate and cleft lip, um, cleft lip really doesn't involve speech too much because it's not something that a person can't have surgically repaired and then speak. Um, but often a patient who has had a cleft palate will have a hyper nasal voice quality. So something like this where there's an open opening uh, in the roof of the mouth um, and the palate itself is not intact. And so um, there can certainly are surgeries, and typically we're part of a team, maybe with um, the oral surgeon, um, an orthodontist. Um, there can be many medical disciplines involved in something like that. And uh, that we would consider to be both a voice problem and um, often a speech articulation problem. How has your field evolved over the decades? Tremendously. Uh, I, uh, you mentioned you've been doing this for a number of years, and I too, I think I'm on my 42nd year of uh, working in this field. And um, when I first... Since you were 10. Exactly. I was barely crawling. Um, so uh, 
since I've started, for example, we work now with people who have swallowing issues uh, following a stroke, again, a traumatic brain injury. Um, and the area is called dysphagia. When I went through my education, there was no dysphagia. There was nothing like that. And um, when I was in school, we worked on articulation. So we worked one sound at a time. If a child had maybe 10 articulation errors that w needed work, we worked on each one separately. And now we work in a, a, a process called phonological disorders where we can teach a number of sounds at one time because of the similarity of how the sound is made. So um, there have been advances across the board um, and obviously with advances in medicine, uh, we've, we've learned a lot from that. But our scope of practice has grown accordingly. Um, so much more encompassing of um, ages, um, backgrounds, those areas. Well, I must say, you speak so articulately and it makes me think about how in this world it's nice for people to be sincere and natural and dedicated to good causes as you are. However, we have many people who are very affected and phony, which drives me crazy really, uh, especially politicians who put on theatrics and change their accents in order to appease or pander to an audience, and I find that revolting. Um, but are people trained in, the, in those areas how to speak more effectively? Is this part of speech pathology? Well, we, when we work on accents, um, of course, we are blessed in our nation to have representatives from all countries. And when they go, when they learn English, often some of the sounds are difficult for others to understand because the influence of their first language impacts the second language. So their speech can be different. Um, if, for example, let's say here at Nova Southeastern we have um, a faculty member who is based from another country but is using medical terms. Um, sometimes students will have difficulty in understanding um, the word that's being said. So it's not just here in terms of the medical school but across disciplines. Um, for example, if you go into law, you have to be understood in the courtroom. And so we do um, it's not a disorder, it's a difference, but we do do work in accent reduction. Uh, we provide that at our clinic on campus for those that are interested in doing that. We, of course, also have students from all over the world. So we don't want the way they speak to negatively impact the comprehension of others. And so we can work on that and give them strategies, but it's, it's a speech issue, it's not a disorder. Fascinating. I'd like to ask you if, if we can change topics for a moment. Sure. Could you share with our audience what brought you into speech pathology? Tell us about yourself a little if you may. So I grew up in Connecticut and I think when I was about 15 or 16 I volunteered um, in a summer to work with hearing impaired children and I just fell in love with it. I knew that this was something that I wanted to do. So I went on to college. Um, I was offered a full scholarship to go for my master's degree at the University of Oklahoma, where I knew not one soul in the entire state, but it was a great experience for me. Of course, I made great friends. And then I came down here and worked for um, a charity. I, at this point, I'd had my master's and I was certified by our professional association. And I worked at Easter Seal for probably close to 15 years, I guess. And then I was offered to supervise students in the clinical practicum here at Nova. And I was a clinical supervisor, and then the clinical director, and then the uh, director of the department. And now, uh, within the last five years, I've been named the chair of the department, and it certainly uh, my privilege to serve in that role. What a career. I'd like us to pause for a moment and take this commercial break, but we'll be right back. We 
We're back with Dr. Newman. I'd like to ask you, how did your department evolve or develop in the time you've been here at Nova University? Well, that's a good, that's a very interesting question for me because when we first started, we only had students that were on campus and um, that has evolved tremendously. Uh, we have regional campuses in Florida, so we um, provide our program through video teleconferencing, for example, in Miami and Palm Beach and Orlando and Jacksonville and Fort Myers and I'm forgetting one. Um, Orlando, maybe. Um, and so we can have students that are able to maintain their home life situation as well as their work situation, and they are connected with our faculty teaching here and the students that are on site here across the state. Then uh, we were the first master's program to develop an online curriculum. And so we are currently the largest master's program in speech language pathology in the United States. And we have students in every state, um, not all the time in every state, but we've had students in every state. And they, they complete their degree in synchronous online chats with their faculty member. And then, of course, they have work to do. Um, in between their weekly sessions. So it's not independent learning, it's a, a classroom setting where they can communicate, we can ask them questions, and it's live time, um, and it's very effective. We find that the outcomes for these students in terms of their success in national exams, their employment rate, and their completion of the program are just aligned with those of the students that are sitting face to face in a classroom. How very efficient and sensible that is. Uh, how about uh, that? <laughs> tell us a little bit more about your personal experiences here in South Florida. You've been here now how many years? Oh, at least um, 35, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I have really just enjoyed so much, in particular, my relationship and my. Uh, position at the university. I have met wonderful people, uh, wonderful students, wonderful faculty, and um, I just am so proud of NSU and the um, part of, of how NSU is such a key part of Broward County and really across the nation at this point. Uh, so that's been wonderful for me, and I've been um, I've had the ability to work with amazing people, um, and I'm also very involved in our professional association, which is the American Speech Language Hearing Association, which has close to, believe it or not, 200,000 members. Um, so it's, it's a profession that's grown tremendously, and, like, and the need is still great. So we still have areas that need more speech language pathologists and audiologists as well. And you are in an enviable situation here, surrounded by intelligentsia, uh, friends uh, of mine such as Abe Fischler and Fred Lippmann, such uh, inspiring individuals that you would deal with on a daily basis and have dealt with. Really lovely. And of course, uh, faculty and the students in general. Tell us more. Well. Yes, I mean, you've, you've hit some very key people, uh, but from our president, uh, Dr. Hanbury, uh, right on down, I think that the, a key part of the success of the university is because of the personal touch. Um, I can uh, work with my dean, you know, I, I, I communicate with him, uh, Dean Stanley Wilson, all the time, but Dr. Lippman is available to me, um, Dr. Hanbury, knows who I am. It's not a place that is so large that you don't have an identity. And I think that's kind of a key part of NSU. Um, and there's an appreciation of our field. Uh, they respect what our students are doing. They're happy to hear about their accomplishments. So uh, it's a situation, I think, where um, not only do I hopefully benefit our faculty and students, but I am rewarded every day in my job. So that's why I'm still here after all these years. Absolutely. What does the future hold? We hear about technology, artificial intelligence, and things that are not related necessarily to therapies, uh, hands-on by specialists that you 
produce here, but what about technology? Well, one of the areas that's really evolving is the area of telepractice. And so um, we can provide speech and language therapy treatment through um, a, a, a computer system. Um, this is helpful with many patients that live in rural areas that may not be able to get to a clinic, a traditional clinic or, or a hospital setting. Um, maybe they're so, they, they must maintain at home or possibly it's just too difficult for transportation. And now we are delivering services um, through technology. And so we see the patient, the patient sees us, and the therapy is provided that way. The other thing that's wonderful about that is let's say someone has a rare communication disorder, um, something, let's say, involving voice. It may be that we can provide a specialist through um, teletherapy, and that would, might not be possible to get them to that specialist who might be states away if it wasn't for this kind of delivery model. And I think that's one of the newest things. Much like other new things, there were people that w weren't sure that it was effective, and it's not necessarily appropriate for all patients. But if it's effective for some patients, then that's, that's a good addition to what we're doing. Dr. Newman, this has been most interesting. Thank you so very much for sharing these thoughts with us. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Thank you. I'll be right back. Schneider Children's Medical Center of Israel is the only pediatric tertiary hospital in the state of Israel. It was established 28 years ago. This hospital changed completely the medical services for a sick child in our country. Since 1995, in the state of Israel we have a national health insurance and all our citizens are completely covered by the health insurance. All our people in our hospital get free of charge all medical services. Schneider Children's Medical Center is the center of excellence for many specialties and subspecialties like endocrinology, cardiology, cardiosurgery, neurosurgery, pulmonology. Our nuclear medical center is the only pediatric nuclear medical center in the country. It is a very important service not only for oncologic patients, it's a very important services for children with infection disease, with urology and many other diseases and one of the leading departments in the world. Nuclear medicine studies in children are quite challenging. We are imaging very small structures. We are injecting very low doses, meaning that the acquisition time is quite long. Sometimes the child is required to lie down still up to 90 minutes without any motion, which is challenging even to the most cooperative child. Many children come here with a lot of anxiety, resulting in crying and moving, so we need to soothe them and calm them. In order to obtain a high quality pediatric nuclear medicine study, you really need to challenge and tackle all those technical difficulties, which requires special expertise. When you have excellent quality from the technical aspect studies and a person who is familiar with pediatric nuclear medicine and with general pediatrics, this combination is translated into more accurate diagnosis and ultimately better patient care. We are concerned about the kidneys and we use the renal scan for evaluating the children and to see whether or not they need the operation. So it's crucial for a really special, dedicated person with whom we can combine our decisions. It's an art and you have to, to be able to interpret it correctly. One of the basic things is to create a child-friendly environment and we do so by using different toys and decorations hanging from the wall. We take the time to explain what's going on, what the study is all about, and there are some very nice ways to explain what nuclear medicine is with dedicated cartoon characters explaining the study procedure to very young children. This is all freely available on YouTube and really helps when the patients go over these clips and come here prepared. We mentioned the fact that there's nothing painful in the study. This helps to relax the children and make them more cooperative. We uh, are sending the children before the study to a different unit in the hospital when, where they insert IVs. We use those IVs, uh, those cannulas, to inject the radiopharmaceutical 
and we don't even have to be the bad guy that sticks the child and hurts him when you do this process of setting up an IV. When the child is in the imaging room, we expect the parents to be part of the study. They sit beside the child, calm him, talk to him, they can hold his hand in some positions. We do have some dedicated devices to secure them to the imaging bed, like dedicated straps. We are even using a vacuum mattress that helps to secure the child. It's quite comfortable for the children and helps to prevent this unwanted motion during the study. We decided to create a video ceiling which will enhance the child's experience. It's a custom-made video ceiling that was created for us by a video company called Creative Labs. Also some children cable TV channels contributed some of their clips. This really creates a very relaxed and friendly atmosphere, improves cooperation, reduces motion, and we get much better studies. Perhaps the most important part in getting better pictures and avoiding sedation or anesthesia is the technologist himself. So you really need people here that know how to work with children. They need to be patient, they need to be empathic, and uh, by doing that, they really take the time to work with each child individually according to his needs, and they get what they need. In pediatric nuclear medicine, we still use pinhole collimators, which are not easy to find nowadays. A pinhole collimator improves the spatial resolution of the image dramatically, which is important when you're imaging small structures. It also provides true optical magnification. Another technique I find very useful in pediatric study is resolution recovery processing of the studies. This is actually post-image acquisition processing that, as the name states, improves the spatial resolution. The utility that we're using in pediatric nuclear medicine studies is motion correction. So you can correct for motion when you're doing dynamic scans. This is quite easy. A bit more challenging is spec motion correction. We are using spec motion correction uh, software that sometimes actually saves the study. Arto Barsever is very experienced and he knows the protocols of the studies that are performed in the, in the United States and in Europe and we sometimes combine with different methods. The fact that I am the chair of the EANM Pediatric Committee, my basic pediatric nuclear medicine training originates from the United States. Life Extension Magazine brings you new discoveries in health and anti-aging. Our science-based research and supplements are so advanced, they're many years ahead of the medical mainstream with quality control standards that exceed FDA mandates. Life Extension has covered groundbreaking medical research for more than 35 years. For your health and future, you deserve the best. Learn more at lifeextension.com. This concludes our special show for today from On Location at Nova Southeastern University. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.